I joined a new church back in uh, 2002. Durham uh, is in Durham, and the name of the church was Resurrection United Methodist Church. I joined it because I had moved out to Durham, and um, it was 2002. And what we were, what were we as a nation thinking about in 2002? Well, we were in the aftermath of September 11th. And so I was going to Sunday school and, and all these uh, other folks. We, and, and what came up in discussion again and again, uh, either before class, after class, before worship, was um, Afghanistan, because we were right on the verge of going into Afghanistan, and Iraq was just over the horizon. And we were t arguing about whether it was the right thing to do. And, and those arguments... Um, they were shedding a lot of heat, but not much light, if you catch my drift. There were a lot of people being very stubborn with what they thought, but we weren't really getting anywhere. And, and, and I got a little bit frustrated with this. And, um, and now, having ac at that point, having access to the library at the seminary for the first time, I figured, well, let me go do some research. And let me find out about, about this. And let's at least get on the same page about what we're arguing about. And, and so I, I brought... Um, that I put together this handout that you probably grabbed a copy of as you came in, and it, it lays out um, this idea of just war, because we kept on arguing about, is this war just or not? Is this a just war? And, and after I, I spent a Sunday and presented this all to the people in the Sunday school room, Sunday school class, and, and I don't know if I changed anyone's minds. I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm fairly certain I didn't. But at least we were all arguing with the same terminology. We were all arguing with the same uh, framework. And I think that was a, it was a worthwhile thing to do. And I, I think it still continues to be something we need to think about because I, it's not like we've had a great explosion of peace in the last decade, have we? In the last decade, we have watched uh, the Middle East continue to be a place of fervor. Uh, Russia has gotten kind of squirrely invading Georgia and Ukraine in the last decade. Um, Africa with Darfur, I mean, there have just been a lot of problems around the world. And uh, I, I could not have planned it like this, but uh, I originally started thinking about this because the, America was looking at getting militarily involved in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and what's the news of the last week? We're about to spend, send 1,500 soldiers into Iraq now. Wow, that uh, couldn't have planned this, but it, it reinforces to me at least that we need to be thinking about this. Um, so we need to, we're going to spend the next uh, two weeks thinking about um, just war and, and pacifism. And just for my own knowledge, has anyone ever heard sermons preached on this before? Just war and pacifism? Wow. Okay, well, brand new territory. It'll be fun. Um, I'll tell you up front that I am not going to try to convince you that one approach is better than the other. I'm not going to try to say this is right and the other one's wrong. Um, in fact, that, that's the official Methodist stance. This is the official big old book of Methodism, and, and this is our stance. We deplore war and urge the peaceful settlement of all disputes among nations. From the beginning, the Christian conscience has struggled with the harsh realities of violence and war, for these evils clearly frustrate God's loving purpose for humanity. We yearn for the day when there will be no more war and people will live together in peace and justice. Some of us believe that war and other acts of violence are never acceptable to Christians. We also acknowledge that many Christians believe that when peaceful alternatives have failed, the force of arms may regretfully be preferred to unchecked aggression, tyranny, and genocide. So that's our official position. We're not sure. Pacifists and, and just war both, uh, have a, that both has a space in, in the Methodist church. So today we'll look at uh, just war, next week pacifism, and then the week after that Larry Linville will be here and he will not be talking about that at all, but I just thought I'd remind, remind you he's showing up soon. So war, it, it, it's part of the Old Testament tradition, we, we heard about it just a minute ago that uh, there were laws in the Torah about how to go to war, and, and we hear that, that the people are involved in war, and then we hear the Old Testament say pretty clearly, love your neighbor. And so then this is then what Jesus repeats down the road, Jesus' command to love your neighbor even if your neighbor is the enemy. And so this, become, this become, begins the start of a, a way of thinking through this challenge. How do you love your neighbor when your neighbor is an enemy? 
How does that work? How do you love your neighbor when your neighbor is an enemy? And, and this is a question of love. The, the whole just war tradition is not picking the lesser of two evils, bad and worse. It is saying that this is the way that we love your neighbor. So just war is a good thing. And, and well, however, and though it might be a struggle to do, it can be done. We could go get involved in the struggle against ISIL or ISIS or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, the Islamic State in Syria, uh, because they are our neighbors, and distant neighbors admittedly, but they are our neighbors, and, and we need to get involved because they are hurting the, themselves by their sin and hurting others by their sin, and if we can stop that from happening, we need to do so, because that's a way to love other people. That, that's an example of sort of this just war tradition thinking. And so the key to this is loving your neighbor. And it's when we stop loving our neighbor, that's when the just war tradition sort of fades away and just becomes violence for the sake of getting your way. I, I was reading through the history of Vietnam and, and thinking about that and thinking about this and, and I think one of the crucial turning points in Vietnam was the point when it went from it being a trying to love our neighbor to instead calling the, the, the uh, Vietnamese uh, Charlie or many other, y'all know the, the racial slurs used in Vietnam. There's a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to go into them. But the point at which it goes from loving your neighbor to calling them racial slurs, that, that's when the just war, we're not following the just war tradition anymore and war goes off the rails. And so to keep uh, Christians involved in war, focused on loving neighbor, the church has developed a set of practices and virtues. It's not a checklist, but a way of life. What you often see, if you have see like a newspaper article talking about a war coming up, or something like a war coming up, it's like we schedule them, sorry. Uh, an impending war, you see a little like box with like the checklist of all the seven criteria for just war, and just war is sort of reduced to here, do you have check, 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 you can go to war and it's just now. That's that's not actually what the just war tradition is about. It's not about a checklist or a set of rules. Just war is about uh, creating people who are just, who can then go, be trusted to go to war. I can't give you a checklist that can, pre that can prevent the massacre at My Lai in Vietnam. But what we can do as a church is create just people who would not even consider doing something like that. Right? That, that's what the just war tradition is focused on. Creating people who are just people who are so committed to loving their neighbor that they can be trusted to go to war, e e even in that hard case. And so the practices that are necessary for the church to, to practice, to create people who can be trusted to go to war, uh, the first one is legitimate authority. And, and the way this is often uh, sort of boiled down is legitimate authority, when it comes to war, is having someone in the right position make a decision. It, 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 who is the right Who's, who are the right people to make a decision about whether America goes to war? It's the Senate, right? Legitimate authority is not about having people in the right position make the decision. It's having the right people in those positions to make the decision. You see the difference there? It's not about having the right position. It's about having the right people in those right positions so that when we choose our leaders, we choose leaders who, we, who are the right people who we can trust to make decisions about matters as important as war. And so the first practice of just war for the church is to train and raise up leaders that we trust. All right? People we can trust and say, you know what, if you make this decision, I will follow you in this situation. So that's legitimate authority, just cause. This is where it gets really fun, because usually, why, what's the most often cited reason for going to war? Right? What's the most off? Why do people go to war? Self-defense. Right? That, that's, the, the, that's the logic of it. Self-defense. You know what the just war tradition says to self-defense? Hooey! Hooey! That's not what this is about. Jesus says, love your neighbor. What's self-defense about? Yourself! Right? And so the just war tradition says, this is not about you protecting yourself. This is about you seeking the good of your neighbor. This is about seeking the common good, the good of all the people involved in the situation. So the just war tradition is about creating Christians who are committed to the common good, to the good of my neighbors as well as myself. 
And, and so, what's the hardest thing to get people to get support of today? What's the hardest type, type of war to get support for? humanitarian intervention, right? We sort of wring our hands about, should we get involved in this? Should we get involved in that? The just war tradition says, if it's for the common good, and you can get involved to help someone, how dare you not? Sounds pretty interventionist, doesn't it? It is. If you have the ability to seek the common good, and it is the good of your neighbor, no matter how far away that neighbor lives, you get involved. Just war is not about self-defense. The just cause in just war is not about self-defense. It's about getting involved for the good of others. And if that means that our, we as a nation are going to sacrifice, that's what it takes. And so legitimate authority, having the right people to make the decisions, just cause, making the decisions to go to war for the good of the common good... And then the next step to it is right intent. And this is the core of the Christian just war tradition. If we are trained to love our neighbors even when our neighbor is our enemy, this shapes everything else. Because if you're trying to love someone, there are certain things you will not resort to. There are certain things you simply won't do. You'd rather lose than resort to certain uh, measures. Certain... General Westmoreland in uh, Vietnam once said, we had to destroy the village to save it. And the just war tradition says, no, no, sorry, that doesn't fly, Duder. That just doesn't fly. Last resort, the next step in this just war tradition. The last resort is, is a way of thinking about just war says that... Um, you got to have some imagination. Form your imagination to try other things first. Really give diplomacy a try. Really give sanctions a try. Really give other ways of solving this a try. Don't just look at it and say, you know what, that's a nail. i got a hammer. Let's go to town. All right? That's what usually happens. If you, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Last resort says try other things first. Reasonable chance of success. War must be winnable using the means that are in line with the just war tradition. Otherwise, you're just increasing suffering. If you go to war and you're gonna, you know you're going to lose and you do it anyways, you're just hurting people. You're not actually doing it out of, out of love. You're just hurting people. Discrimination. Uh, don't kill civilians. This is... Um, this seems fairly obvious, right? You don't kill civilians. And we say that, but we still have that wonderful term for killing civilians, and you know what it's called? Collateral damage, right? When you try to kill, kill the combatant and you end up killing civilians, it's called collateral damage. It's a wonderful euphemism. But the just war tradition forms us to say, if, we are, if it's going to take killing civilians to get something done, we'll find another way. And if that means more of our soldiers die in the process, so be it. That's what it means to love your neighbor. In proportionality, you use only the amount of force needed to achieve the desired goal, which again may make for a longer war. If, if, if the force needed is, is, is this much, you don't go in with a whole lot more. It, it, if it means that it's going to be a longer war, that is part of, of the just war tradition, is being patient. Now you might hear this and say, you know what, Andy, that... No war has ever measured up to that standard. That sounds crazy. That sounds too hard. Um, and, and you can take these measures and you can apply it to any war and there is not going to be a war that's going to measure up. I mean, World War II, the, the war to save the world, right? World War II. Uh, how did the World War II end? With the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We bombed civilian targets. And what was the calculus of that? How did that work? That decision was made because it would end the war sooner and then soldiers wouldn't have to die. If we're going to go by the just war tradition, what we're going to say is civilians are never to be targeted. And if that meant more soldiers were going to die, that's part of just war. That's part of sacrifice for loving your neighbor. Right? Now, so you see here the just war tradition, if it sounds kind of hard, you're right, it is. So is the Ten Commandments. And if I can't measure up the Ten Commandments, does that make them less true? If we don't measure up to the just war tradition, does that make it less true? Just because it's hard doesn't make it wrong. Now there are two approaches to violence that we're not going to spend any time on. I was going to spend some time on last Sunday and then I had a kid. So I'll give you the really short version. Uh, police. Police use the least amount of force necessary to preserve the common good. Yay, police. 
Crusade, that's the other, uh, the other end of the spectrum. Crusade is the use of violence. Um, in Crusade is the way of using violence that sees myself as pre completely good and you as completely evil. That, that's the Crusade mentality. I'm right, you're wrong, so because you're wrong, because you're evil, I can do anything I want to you because you're evil. And, and that just completely gets rid of the, our, our faith that says everyone's made in the image of God. No matter what a person does, they're always made in the image of God. And so the whole Crusade mentality simply cannot fly. It, it simply can't. So, um, that's the just war tradition. How does that impact how we live today? It impacts how we live today in some obvious ways, like the leaders we choose matter. We need to have the right people in office to make these decisions on our behalf. Um, but also, it matters to our lives because we do enter into conflict on occasion. It, it's rare, I hope it's rare in your lives, but there are times when we enter into conflict. And to handle conflict in our lives, we, we are tempted to resort to violence. I mean, you, 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 find your, you ever find yourself thinking about someone and wish they'd just stop talking because they're obviously wrong and you're obviously right and you just wish they'd just admit it? You're, you're right, Andy, I was wrong and I'll just change my mind and I'll just stop being a pain in your butt. You ever find yourself thinking something like that? All right. Just War Tradition is a, a little bit of a help, a little bit of, bit of a guidance right here. Because there are times when loving our neighbor is easy and there are times when loving our neighbor is really rather challenging when we don't like them, when they have hurt us. And the first thing to do is not to enter into a crusade. When, when we enter into a crusade, uh, when I am right and you are wrong and I am good and you, and you are evil, that... It's just going to go off the rails because anything I can do to beat you is going to be what I do. And you know what that looks like today? It looks like our politics, right? We just had an election. You know, the election has two parties who just spend months telling us that the other side is evil. And then they try to get together and govern, and you know what happens? They can't. They just spent the entire months on a crusade against the other side. There's a great sign I saw on TV. Uh, who's the guy? John, um, The Daily Show, he held up a sign that said, I disagree with you, but I'm pretty sure you're not Hitler. And I thought that, that sort of captures it. That's how we approach politics. So when you find yourself in conflict, we are tempted to enter into a crusade because I'm obviously right and you're obviously wrong and the just war tradition says stop that and start thinking through the way that we can love our neighbor even when we really don't want to. And so that, that involves things like just cause, working towards the common good. When, when there's a situation of conflict, whether we're part of it or not, how often do you find yourself saying, that's not my business? Do you ever say that, that's not my business? Just War Tradition says, if it's for the common good, it is your business. Which is not to say get involved in everything and be nosy. But it does say, if you see a child that you're not sure whether they're being taken care of, you got to do something. If you see a, a woman who you think may not be being treated right, you got to do something. One in three women are, are victims of domestic uh, abuse, right? And, and so to say that it's not my business, the just war tradition says it is your business. It's for the common good. Get involved. Right intent. When you're in a conflict, are you acting out of love for your neighbor or are you just trying to be right? Last resort, don't argue, fight first, wait and listen. Discrimination, if someone does me wrong, don't go I don't go after their family members. Um, proportionality, if someone hurts me a decade ago and I run into them again, don't, don't try to hurt them back. I mean, these are the ways that the just war tradition guides our conflicts today. My, my friends, the, the just war tradition, it, it is not only a way to think about conflict all the way around the world, it ends up being a way to think about a conflict in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's, a, and it's a set of practices. And, and, and I think that's why it's so essential. It's not some sort of abstract checklist. It's a set of practices that reminds us of things like the person that you're angry at this week is, a, is as welcome to this table as you are. And so next time you find yourself being angry at someone, maybe the right thing to do is to seek their good. Right, love your enemy. That's the just war tradition. Love your enemy, invite them to a table, send them a cup of coffee, do something for them instead of something at them. Amen.